ever going to have it all figured out, right? I don't have a problem with that. I don't have a problem not having all the answers. Because once I get all the answers, then it becomes stale and dry and boring. And Well, anyway. Here we go. We're going to open up with some scripture. And then we're going to just see where God wants to go. I'm going to start. The title of my sermon today is God's Training. And I'm going to start from Hebrews 12, and I'm going to read to verse 11. I got the English Standard Version just because I didn't realize it was the English Standard Version until I had already did all my sermon notes. I went back to reread it, and I thought, what is this? But it's what we're going with, okay? Father, or here we go. Therefore, verse 1, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And, and have you forgotten the exhortation that addressed you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the disciplines, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God has treated you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left alone, if you are left with that discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. So shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all of discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness by those who have been trained by it. So I want to lay a little background, then we'll open up with some prayer, and we'll go back through this, okay? So what's going on here is this writer of Hebrews has been given the task to write to some Jews, Hebrews, how do I know because the book's named Hebrews, that are wanting to quit. They have come under great persecution and they, and they want to give up. He's all the way back, he's, he's laying out that Jesus is the Messiah, this is the one. You go up to Hebrews, you know, Hebrews 10 26 has been used to come against what we preach. It says, if you sin, if anyone sins willfully, there remains not another sacrifice for them. And so people say, when we say all sin has been forgiven, past, present, future, people will say, no, not all sin, all sin but willful sin. Now, can I, if you be honest with yourself, how many times have you sinned lately that it wasn't willful? You didn't accidentally fall into sin, right? Like you willfully committed it. But, but this, this is not what he's, he's not talking about you getting up on Saturday morning, eating a BLT and wearing cotton and polyester shorts to go mow your yard. Some of you are going, what's I got to do with it? I just named off three things that were, would be sin in the Old Testament. You couldn't eat pork. You couldn't work on Saturday. You're not supposed to wear mixed linens. This is not the sin he's talking about. He's, these are people that are beginning to become under such great persecution that, that the writer of Hebrews is saying, if you reject the one sacrifice for all time, there remains not another sacrifice for you. He's laying out a foundation saying, this is the one sacrifice. And if you go back to that rule keeping, you go back to sacrificing animals, the blood of bulls and goats will not cover sin. It will not deal with sin. If you go back to that, there's not another sacrifice out there. This is the only one. Then he goes into Hebrews 11. And in Hebrews 11, he says, he, we know it as the hall of faith, right? It's the, 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 the chapter that's all on faith. And he begins to tell them, he's like, hey, your forefathers... They were cut in two. They were beaten. They were whooped. They, they, these guys did all of this, and they didn't even have the promise. But they did all these things. And then he goes into Hebrews 12, and he says, in, in verse 1, he says, he says, you've been surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. And so he's laying out to these guys, 
like, like, like these guys are wanting to quit. He's trying to say, listen, Jesus is the only way. And look, you've got people that have come before you that has been persecuted, has been cut in two, and they don't have the same promise that you had. And he goes to Hebrew 12 and he says, and all those people that laid the groundwork for you to be where you're at, they are actually surrounded you and they are cheering you on to finish the race that you've started. So if you will, we're going to pray, we're going to put a prayer, we're going to get into this sermon, okay? Father, I thank you. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the, the, the seed that has been planted in our hearts, Lord. Today, Lord, I ask you that you would that you would take this seed and you would plant it even deeper, Lord, and you would put water on it and it would begin to produce a harvest in our lives, Father. I thank you for your word. I thank you that, you, that your word is inspired and it, and, it, and it reveals to us who you are, who you truly are, what you think about us, Father. And today, Father, I ask you to let the words that would come from this microphone to be anointed, Lord. I ask you that the words would bring spirit and they would bring life in this place today in Jesus' name. I got a, I got a quick video I want you to watch because it goes along with my, my sermon. Delane sent it to me this week and, I, and it fit perfectly. So let's watch this real quick and then I'll get back into this. I remember my little niece ran up to me and told me, we learned about Jesus today. And I could tell by her smile, she was so excited to learn about this man that she did not quite know yet, but she knew without a doubt for it to be true, because after all, mommy said so. And that was the first time in my life that I looked into the eyes of a child and envied them, because she had no idea of what it feels like to doubt. What it feels like to have your entire belief system overloaded with skepticism. To never know the day that you would finally be able to live beyond the shadow of a doubt. I've lived in its darkness for so long. It, it seems like I have all the right questions. But never enough answers. And my faith is small enough to fit in the cracks of my palms. God. Every night I lay my head down to sleep, the city of my mind is attacked by a legion of questions threatening the living rooms of my sanity and holding them hostage. Can you help me? Last year, my grandmother laid in a hospital bed like a bus stop waiting for God to come pick her up. I had never seen such pain. And such confidence living in the same eyes when she told me, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I know who I belong to. And I was so happy for her. And something inside of me wished that somehow before she passed away, she could pass down her confidence in God to me like an old family picture. I remember sitting in the back row of a cold sanctuary, crying because I desperately wanted what the preacher was saying to be true, but my doubts were preaching a sermon of their own, and the streams of my tears turned into oceans of frustration. I remember sitting in a college classroom, and the only thing being tested is my faith in God. The only thing passing is my hope. Me, in a backpack full of fear, and nowhere to go. No one to help me unpack. I sleep. I sleep, but I never rest. These lines around my eyes are not wrinkles. They are maps that show you the winding roads that lead to my pain. I'm tired. I'm tired. And I'm longing for the day that I can place my fingers in his nail-pierced hands because honestly, I've considered quitting, but where will I go? Back. There's no home for the living in the land of the dead, so I keep pressing forward. Today I have faith, but I can't make any promises about tomorrow. I'm surprised I've held on this long. God, just make me feel like I'm not crazy. God, let me know that I'm not just making friends with these walls. When I pray, I'm not questioning you. I just got questions. Don't leave me here.
child. My child, when it seems like you have all the right questions, but never enough answers, and your faith is small enough to fit in the cracks of your palms, I told you. Faith the size of mustard seeds can rearrange whole landscapes and turn mountains into open highways. Faith comes by my word, so maybe you've cuffed your ears, my child. Don't be childish. But consider the child whose faith has not quite learned the definition of impossible. Have your questions. I'm not telling you to have a blind faith. I'm telling you to consider the blind men who had faith and believed my words before they were even able to see me. Consider the birds that eat from my hand and do not fall from the sky without my consent. So how much more will I love the ones that I died for? Before you doubt me, doubt your doubts. Doubt your doubts, and you will see they are just as empty as the tomb that I walked from. Truth is, truth is, you know I'm here. You know my truth, and you're scared. Scared of what that means. Scared of what that should cost you. That one day, they will all laugh at you, laugh you right out of their classrooms and scorn you out of their courtrooms. But my love serves as an eviction notice to anxiety. When they cast stones, my love casts out fear. I am the author and finisher of your faith. I've never started a work that I will not finish. I am the one. I am the one who will give you courage to stand death in the face and say, how dare you try to scare me? I know who I belong to. And when it feels like you are drowning, when it feels like you are drowning in a sea of your questions, just know I'm there. I'm there. Like when I drowned in the Red Sea of my blood for you, and these hands that took holes will hold you. And when I told you that I would love you forever, I meant it. Don't you see these rings in my hands? See, we are married. For better or for worse. Through sickness and in health, through faith and through questions, till death brings us closer, you are mine. since coming to faith in Jesus Christ have ever doubted? I mean, if we're being honest, and how many of you coming to faith in Jesus Christ has even thought about quitting? Maybe some of you in here have quit. Came to faith in Jesus Christ and have quit. Well, today, this sermon is for you. For those who've thought about quitting, for those who have doubted, maybe some of you are doubting today. Maybe some of you have got questions in your mind today and you're thinking, I don't know that I should keep going on. I don't know that I should keep doing this, right? Like, like the reality of it is, is, is some of you uh, maybe gave your life to Jesus in, under the presumption that if I give my life to Jesus, that things are going to start getting better in my life. Like the second that I come to Jesus, things should start do, going good. My life should be better. And, the, and then maybe you, you came to Jesus and things didn't start getting better. And maybe you keep pressing and you're just thinking, what, what's going on here? Like, Jesus, things are supposed to start getting better. My life is supposed to start getting better. You know that song we sing, uh, Oceans? I've said this before, but I think it bears uh, repeating today. I want to read a couple of the scriptures from, or a couple of the verses from that song. It says, you call me up on the waters, the great unknown where feet may fail. And there I stand you, there I find you in the mystery, in oceans deep, my faith will stand. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters, wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger 
in the presence of my Savior. That song is anointed, right? Like you could be, you could be about ready to kill your kids in the car, and that song come on, and you, you block everything out, you kick that thing up, and you're praising God, right? I think God hoodwinked us because He put His anointing on that song, and when that comes on, it doesn't matter what you're going through, you're going to begin to sing that song. But do we really listen to what we're the permission we're giving God, God? Take me to a place that I don't know where my feet may fail. God, take me to a place where my trust has no borders. What do you trust in? Trust in your job? You trust in your spouse? You trust in your friends? Is that where you place your trust? Because if that's where you place your trust, what you're saying to God is, God, it's okay if you remove if you will take my job, if you will take my spouse, because I'm asking you to take me to a place where the things that I trusted are no longer there. That's my prayer. That's what I'm saying. I'm giving God permission every Sunday when I say this, is to take me to hard places, God. Now I know when we say this, we're thinking like, God, take me to Africa where I can preach to 10,000 people, Lord. That's where I want to go, but that's not really what we're saying. We're saying, God, whatever it is that I hold on to, whatever it is I trust into, Lord, I give you permission to remove that out of my life. So that when the oceans is deep, I, I, Lord, I give you permission to do a work in my heart that when oceans are deep, when I feel like I'm drowning, that, that, I, can, that I know you're my Savior and I can look you in the eyes. I've given you permission to do that. He said, well, what does that look like? Well, I'm going to pick on Kyle because he's not here today. Yeah. Two weeks ago, Kyle is going home from church and his transmission starts going out on his car. Gets at home. Next morning, the very next morning, his wife, Amanda, happens to be at the grocery store and their van goes down. God, take me to where my trust is without borders. What does that look like? Kyle calls me and he says, having a hard time. I'm, I'm about to lose my temper. I was like, yeah, I'll probably punch my car by now. But, see, and in all of that, I know the big picture, but maybe in the middle of Amanda sitting in a parking lot, Kyle's at work, don't have a car to go help her out with, the kids are crying, the diaper needs to be changed, she, one of them needs to be fed, and they're sitting there going, where are you in the middle of this? What are you doing? In this. So I think we all can relate with that a little bit, right? Like every one of us have been in some places where it's like, what did I do wrong, Lord? What did I do to cause this to happen? And I'm not saying that my actions doesn't cause consequences because this, the truth of it is, is my action caused consequences, right? But, the, but we feel like sometimes we're in the middle of something and it's like, God, can't you just wave your magic wand over this and just make it better? Can't you just do something? And when we see that one time after another, see, these Hebrews, these Jews, they were actually facing a little bit of different type of persecution. They were actually coming in and shutting their businesses down. They were coming in, their families were rejecting them because they called the name of Jesus. Some of them had to deal with uh, family members being crucified, fed to lions, killed because they call on the name of Jesus. I'm not saying that our struggles aren't bad. Or we have our own struggles here. There's a different type of struggle. But these guys were facing struggles and they were saying, I, you know, maybe I won't quit, but maybe I'll just kind of tone down that name of Jesus a little bit. Maybe when I'm in Starbucks, I'm not going to talk about Jesus so loudly. Or maybe I'm at McDonald's because, because the persecution is a little bit more than I can handle. Maybe, Lord, if you would just get this car fixed, if you'd restore this marriage, I'd claim your name. But, but since I've come to you, Lord, man, things have got bad. And I thought the promise was things were going to get good. Don't get me wrong. When you come to Jesus, He promises you that He will give you rest. He promises you He'll give you peace. He promises you that He will actually do a work in you, that He is the potter, you're the clay, and He's going to mold you, and He's going to shape you, and He's going to do things. But sometimes that's not actually fun. Right? Amen. Well, God is revealing some things into your life. I'm going to get ahead of my notes here, but I'm just going to flow with this. 
When we say, God, take me to where my trust is without borders, sometimes we've got some things that have been planted so deep in our heart, some hurt, some rejection, some bitterness, some offense, that when we say that, what we're saying is, is God, you can come into my heart and you can take these things out. And we think that he's going to take a magic wand to do it, but the reality of it is, is it don't always look like that. The reality of it is that sometimes you're going to find yourself in circumstances that reveals what's in your heart. Amen. And then we say, Lord... I want to go, I want to do whatever you want me to do. And he's saying to you, I can't take you to your destiny if you're going to hold on to some of these things in your heart. Not because, not because that you've got to reach some spiritual maturity before God can use you. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is that if he takes you to the place that he designed you to go and you're still carrying the baggage of yesterday, the baggage of yesterday will eventually destroy what he's trying to do over here. And so sometimes he's got to remove some stuff over here so he can get you here. Because when you get here, there's going to be something else that he's going to say, hey, that thing that you've been holding on since you were 10 years old, it's time to let it go because I'm going to take you to another place. I'm going to jump right in here. Right, actually, I'm going to read this scripture. Romans 8, 28. Awesome scripture. I pray this scripture over people every time I pray. When I'm going through something, I claim this scripture over, over my life. And we know that, the, that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. If you come up here in a prayer line and you tell me that you're going through a hard time, I remind you every single time. God's going to take that circumstance and He's going to work it for your good. But see, I think that when we hear this, we, we kind of think it's like a Disney thing, right? Like, like, like Queen Elsa gets her kingdom back in just a snap. Right? We're all, ooh. And people go, what happened to you? I saw you yesterday and you were miserable. Romans 8, 28. I, I got the Romans 8, 28. Man, that don't really work. Dude, I got a tattoo on my arm. God's going to work all things out for the good of those. Let's look at that, though. He says, and we know that those who love God, though, we, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together. Those who love God... All things work. Now, I know we're a grace church, and we don't like talking about work, but that's what it says, right? It says that the King James, the New King James, work. That God works things out. Well, I just want, if God could just remove this pain out of my life, God's working on that pain. If God could just pay my bill, God's working in that. What's the deal about work? Work takes time. It doesn't start. God's working. God is working. It isn't, a, it isn't a, a magic wand that he just blood. I'm not telling you he can't do that. He can do whatever he wants to do. He's God. He sits in heaven. He does what he pleases. But what I'm telling you is, is most of the time that he doesn't do that because if he does that, you never really learn the lesson out of it. So here we go. Here's what I want to say. Here's, here's, I, want to make, I want to bring these two, these two passages together. Romans 8 and Hebrews 12. Because it says God works all things. So what does that look like? What does working, what does God working look like? Let's start with Hebrews 12, verses 3 and 4. He's, this is what the writer of Hebrews, he is, he is trying to convince these people that are dying for the name of Jesus. He's trying to convince these people that are being persecuted for the name of Jesus. He's trying to convince these people that are being disowned for the name of Jesus. He's trying to convince them that you've got to stick with this thing. Okay? And he starts out here. He says, Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. So what's he telling these guys? He's saying to these guys, hey, I don't know what you're going through. I don't know everything. I don't know all the details. But what I am going to tell you is that you have not died yet. See, the problem we have is, is when we're going through something, I'm going through something. I like to say this. Nobody understands what I'm going through. 
Yeah, yeah, I know what you're saying. I know what you've been through. But you don't understand what I'm going through. This is what they're beginning to say to the writer of Hebrews. They're saying, hey, you don't know, you don't know what we're going through. And he's saying, listen, you're still alive. Some people have died for this message. What happens when we begin to say, you don't understand what I'm, I'm the only person that's been through this. As I begin a self-pity party and I begin to put myself above everybody else and I begin to make my problem bigger than my God. Right? I don't doubt my doubts, I doubt my God. What are they facing? He says that they are facing hostility. Let's jump in verse 5. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addressed you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by Him. For the Lord disciplines the one He loves and chastises every son whom He receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there who, fought, who his father does not discipline? I want to say one thing. Discipline is not punishment. Okay? And I want to say another thing. God does not give you sickness to discipline you. God does not give you disease to discipline you. Right? I'm going to get ahead of my notes a little bit, but I'm just going to say it right now. Discipline, the word discipline means to train. Okay? Discipline is looking forward. We train. We work out. We practice. We work on our, our we, we read our Bible. We do all these things so that we can be equipped for tomorrow. But punishment always looks back. See, if I'm always looking back, am I going through this situation? Am I going through this problem because of what I did yesterday? I think that I'm being punished. But it, discipline is always being trained to look forward, okay? Tom Landry said this. You guess who Tom Landry is? Ex-coach of the greatest football team to ever grace the planet. The Dallas Cowboys come on. You're my boy, Tony. He said this. He says, my job as a coach is to make these young men do what they don't want to do so that they can become who they want to be. See, God's discipline will always be redemptive. What God is wanting to do in your life, what God is training you to do, is not to punish you or to make you to make you to make you quit. I don't even believe that God, let me say this, I don't even believe God is the one that's causing the persecution to come to the Christians. I believe God is taking what the enemy is intending for bad, and I believe God is using it to train these people to become who he wants them to be. It's, it's when I when I cry out, Lord, take me on waters where my feet may fail. And I say, Lord, do what you gotta do to train me. Do what you gotta do to prepare me. I love verse seven because it says this: It is for discipline that you have to endure. The writer saying. Hey, I know that you're being persecuted. I know that you're being. I know that your businesses are being stolen. I know that you're being beat. I know that. You, I know that you're saying, it, "I'm just going to quit." It is. It was easier before I came to Jesus than what it is right now. I want to quit. The writer of Hebrews says, "It is for discipline that you have to keep going." God is using this situation to prepare you, and you have to keep pushing. You have to keep going. It, it, it's like this. It, I was telling Paul this morning, he's looking awful sexy because he lost a little bit of weight. And, and it'd be like him coming in tomorrow and he's saying, yeah, I'm going to quit this diet. And I would say, no, dude. He's like, it's hard. Yeah, but it's for that discipline that you've been doing that you have to keep going. Right? See, God's not, this discipline has been always been taught that, that, that God will punish you but here's what I'm going to say. If God punishes you, He has to tell Jesus Christ He's sorry because that means that Jesus Christ didn't take the punishment on the cross. But God will discipline you as a son just like you would discipline your sons and your daughters. I'm going to finish up with 
this scripture here. Verse 11. Can you bring it up, James? Verse 11. Oh, you're on the ball, dude. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Well, God, if it's not fun, God can't be in it. If it's not, we're, we're like a nation that loves fun, right? Like I remember when my kids were little, when I was little, grounding meant that I had to go inside, right? And I would be like, there's nothing to do in here. This is not fun. Now we tell kids, you got to go outside. Right? <laughs> hey, there's nothing to do out there. It's not fun. We're like in this microwave society that if things aren't fun, we'd rather, I'm, I'm guilty. Like, that's not fun. That movie wasn't fun. I don't want to do that. It's not fun. It's boring. And sometimes we think that's how God is. Well, if, it's not, if I'm going through some pain, God ain't in it. If I'm going through some hard time, God's not in the middle of my hard time. Like, God wouldn't continue to allow me to feel this type of pain if He loves me. But it says, for the moment, all this all training seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. What if I was to tell you that the circumstances that you're going through, if you would do, if you would stop asking God to get you out of them, but you would say to God, train me, what should show me what I need to know in this circumstance. Because the reason that circumstance is weighing down so heavily on you is because you don't want to be there anymore. But maybe the reason you're there is because God's trying to show you something. And what if I was to tell you that if you would continue and push forward. See, these guys are wanting to quit. These guys are wanting to stop. These guys are no longer wanting to, 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 to continue with the name of Jesus. And here's what I want to tell you today. If you've ever thought about quitting, if you've ever thought about stopping, if you've ever thought about throwing your hands up, and because you're going through a hard time, maybe you need to just keep pushing and keep pressing because maybe, maybe the pain seems too unbearable today, but I promise you that Jesus has promised you that if you will pray, He will give you a peace that passes all understanding. And if you will continue to press forward and you will continue to seek Jesus in the middle of in the middle of that oceans where your feet may fail, where your where your faith is without borders, and you're in a place where you're scared, you don't know what to do, but if you'll keep your eye above the way and you'll look at to Jesus, He will use that very circumstance to train you, to teach you, and to actually make you who you truly are. Because let me explain this. It says that if he says that discipline seems painful. He says, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. And what he's saying is this. If you will continue to speak to that mountain until it comes down, I promise you that there's going to be a peace that comes over you that's going to begin to pass all understanding. He's, and he's saying this. That it will, it will bear a fruit of righteousness in you. Now, we understand this. We understand that. I hope if you go to here, you understand that you are righteous. Right? You've been given a gift of righteousness. Let me, let me give an illustration. I have an apple tree in my backyard. Last year, my apple tree produced zero apples. I was thinking, something wrong with this tree. I Google it. Google tells me all kinds of stuff that I didn't really understand because I'm not a botanist, but I, I just thought, well, if it doesn't work this year, I'm going to the greenhouse. But the thing is, is even though my apple tree didn't produce apples last year, it was still an apple tree. Right? It didn't change its identity because it didn't do what it was supposed to do. So just because maybe you don't produce the fruit of righteousness doesn't change the truth that you are righteous. That's who you are. Okay? But what this is saying is so righteousness is your identity. You are righteous. And sometimes you're running from your problem. The problem that God's trying to do in that problem, in that circumstance, is trying to train you and teach you and show you that you have nothing to fear. You have nothing to be afraid of. You have nothing. There's nothing out there that's bigger than me. And he's trying to reveal something to you of who you truly are. Like, like, like the fruit that's coming out of you is righteousness. Through your circumstances, you stand 
As you stand there and you say, I don't know. I don't understand. I just want to quit. This thing isn't getting easier. This thing is getting worse. This thing is getting harder. I actually miss the days when on Friday night when I was stressed out that I could just go down to the bar and get drunk and fall down because at least I could escape from my problems for a little bit. Like, I just want to quit. And what the writers of Hebrews is trying to tell these guys that want to quit, what I'm trying to tell you today, what God's speaking to you today, is don't quit. Some of you got to get up every morning on Sunday morning. You got to get a baby ready. You got to get yourself ready. And maybe in the middle of that, you're thinking, this thing just isn't working. I don't know why. Why do I keep doing this? I should just quit. And God's saying, don't quit. Trust me in this thing. Find me in this thing. Find me in that ocean where things are rising it's too far. The, the waves seem too big. The mountain seems too tall. The valley seems too deep. He says, don't quit. I know your marriage might be like, seem like it's falling apart. I know your electric bill might seem like it's going to be shut off. But don't quit because I'm doing something in you. I am actually rooting something that's been so deep in you for so long that has held you back from stepping into your destiny. And I'm trying to show you this thing in the middle of this circumstance. And if you will keep forward, keep walking forward, keep moving forward. You don't have to run. You can walk. Matter of fact, I don't care if you crawl. Just don't stop. Amen. He says, I will root this out of your heart and I promise you that, the, 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 you, this storm that you're in right now will come to an end. And when you step out of this storm, you're going to be stronger. You're going to be better. You're going to be, you're going, you're going to be able to face you know, David. He faced he faced a lion and a bear before in private. Sometimes we've got to face some battles in private. Sometimes there's some battles that people don't know that we're going through, that we're going through. And we just think, where's everybody at? Maybe they're dealing with their own problems. Right? When does Romans 8, 28 kick in? I don't know. You're the pastor. Yeah, I'm the pastor, but i got my own problems I'm dealing with. I don't know. I wish it would kick in yesterday because I'm waiting for some of that. See, David had to defeat a lion and the bear in private so that God could equip him so that he would know. If he hadn't defeated that lion and the bear, maybe he would have showed up that day with Goliath and would have ran from the battle, but he didn't. He showed up that day with Goliath and he says, I know that I can defeat this dude because I have defeated these dudes. Right? So whatever you're going through, the circumstance that you're going through, you, if you don't, see, if you don't know that God loves you, you're going to think that God is putting you in a circumstance to punish you. I should have done I should have paid my tithes. I should have showed up to Bible study. I should have showed up to church. I should have did this. I should have did that. And, I, and, and it's, not, it's not about discipline. Now it's about punishment. It's what I did wrong, so God is now putting me through this. And if I think that's the way of God, then I think that I shouldn't be going through this. But if I realize that God loves me, and this circumstance that I am, He is going to use it. He is going to work it out for my good. And when I come out to the end of this, I'm not only going to be equipped to defeat Goliath, I'll be equipped to defeat, defeat any mountain that raises up in my life ever. I'll never stop. I'll never quit. I'll keep moving forward. If I've got to crawl in, I'll crawl in. Because there ain't nothing else to go back to. What do, what do I, I, I quit for what? I stop for what? So, so many times we forget where we come from that we, that we, that we think that if I quit, that, that I, this is not working anymore. We forget where it was like, where we were at, why we decided that we were going to do this in the first place. It's not always easy. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's really hard. But God says that if you will, if you will, if you will let me train you, I know it seems painful right now, but I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. And I'm going to reveal to you, I'm going to make you, I'm going to, I'm going to bring out of you who you truly are. So we're not trying to become anything. We're trying to mature into who he's already made us to be. The very thing, he made you to be righteous. He made you to be holy. He made you to be an overcomer. He made you to speak to mountains and, and they be moved. He made you to be these things. And he's saying, just trust me because if you will trust me, I'm going to, the thing that I do in you is going to manifest who you are in your life. Don't run from it. Don't hide from it. Don't run from your problems. See? 
and I run from my problems, I don't give an opportunity for the promise to manifest in my life. And if I run straight to my problems, full speed ahead, and say, I'm going to face you, I'm going to hit you directly on. I, if Moses wouldn't have went to the Red Sea, the thing would have never split wide open. If Joshua never spoke to the sun and said, be still, it would have never stopped. And if we run from our problems, we're not going to see our breakthrough. We're not going to be trained in it. And we're not going to allow God to do a work in us that reveals who we truly are. Amen. Amen. All right, can you stand up? I'm going to finish one scripture here. Apostle Paul writes this to the Philippians. He says, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Paul says, I, I don't care what happened yesterday. I don't care what happened last year. I don't care what happened one last month. He says, I'm not going to pay attention to what happened yesterday because I'm going someplace. I might be going slower than you are, but I'm not stopping. I'm going to keep moving forward. I'm not going to quit. I'm going to keep going. He says, because I, there is a prize. There is an upward prize. There is a call that Jesus Christ has brought me to. And I don't have time to stop because if I stop, I miss the call. Alright, here we go. Father, I know most everybody's been here for a little bit, but I feel like the Lord told me to offer in, in, in the little worship we had, offer our salvation. If somebody here today would like to receive salvation, or if somebody here today would like to rededicate their life to the Lord, I'm, I'm going to open that up. I'm going to pray, and if that's you, I just want to ask you to come forward. Uh, Father, I thank you. I thank you for your discipline. I thank you for the painful times, Lord, when I, when I look around and say, where are you at? But when I overcome those obstacles, Lord, and I look back, I see your hand has always been in it. I see what you've been doing in my life. I thank you that you've taken me from an immature son and you're moving me to be a, a mature son, Lord. That, that I thank you that, you that you love me, that you will train me, that you don't punish me because there's no punishment, there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ, but you will take every circumstance good, bad, or ugly, you will use it to mold me and shape me because you are the potter and I'm the clay and you're, you're molding me every day, Father. I thank you for that. Amen. Lord, I release your spirit in this place today, Father, that you would touch lives in here right now, Father, that we would look at our circumstances. James writes it like this. He says that count it all the joy when you go through trials and tribulations. Lord, I, if we would change our perception and we would say, I count it to joy because God is going to take whatever I'm going through this week and He's going to turn it for my good. He's going to train me and He's going to give me a peaceable fruit of righteousness. Lord, I ask you that you would, that you would, that you, that we would just change the way we think about every obstacle that we face. And we would see them as opportunities. That our failures are stepping stones. That the thing that was sent to break us is only going to make us. The thing that was sent to tear us down is only going to build us up. The mount that's in my path has to come, has to be cast out into the sea, and the valley that keeps me from getting to where I need to go has to come up to level ground. I thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name I pray. And the saints said, Amen.